offline on social media to bring you real experts who know a lot about very important topics, very interesting topics. They share with us their insight, expertise, their knowledge, and then we give you the chance to ask your questions. That's what we do every Thursday, boom, right here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Normally, we are, uh, uh uh-oh, I can, sorry, I had a problem. Uh, Normally, we're meeting in the Daily Planet Cafe inside the museum. Of course, we can't do that right now. So we're here, at least I'm here, and my special guest tonight, Rob Main, is there. Hi, Rob. Hey, Chris, how's it going? I'm doing great. How are you tonight? I'm excited to be here. Thanks for asking. So everybody, Rob is the Deputy State Risk Officer for North Carolina. And as I understand it, he is an expert in all things cybersecurity, which uh, I think is right on the forefront of everybody's minds these days, just like one step below, maybe two or three steps below, but you know, like actual virus and then computer virus or, you know, Zoom bombing, and how much does Facebook know about you? And all right, as soon as the pandemic hit, everybody jumped online, and then we started seeing all the articles about being safe online, because that's what we're spending a lot of time. And hey, you're hanging out with me here on the internet, I want you to stay safe too. So I'm really glad that we've got one of the best experts, somebody who's thinking about what it means for you and I right here in North Carolina. Now, Rob, did I did I summarize that uh, properly, or is that just like way out left field stuff? No, you did an excellent job. There's a lot of ground to cover. Um, I wish we had more than just a just a short period of time tonight, because this is something that uh, cybersecurity is something that I'm passionate about. Uh, it's important to every aspect of our digital lives. It's a reality of where we're at as a society. You can't get by without having some digital interaction. And with that require, with that comes a requirement to do so in a manner that secures your, per, your personal data. Or if you work in the cybersecurity or IT field or in just in business in general, protecting your customer's data. So we'll jump into that in just a little bit. At the end of the talk, uh, we'll discuss all of the additional social media apps that I downloaded, but uh, I'll save that list for later (laughs) once we all had to start staying home. So uh, everybody, sit back. I hope you're ready to learn something new. Rob, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Good evening, and thank you, Chris and Katie, for extending me this opportunity to share my knowledge and experience with Staying Protected in a digital world. I'm excited to be here this evening and I hope each of you leave this session tonight having learned a thing or two. Now, before I get started, I'd like to ask each of you to do me a favor. While I am introducing myself, I would like to know where your comfort level is with cybersecurity on a scale of zero to five, with five being the absolute most comfortable with cybersecurity in general, whether it be in your professional life or in your personal life. So again, on a scale of zero to five, if you could drop in the chat your number with five being the most comfortable with cybersecurity, that will help me kind of gauge where everybody's at. And I greatly appreciate it. My name is Rob Main. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Oh, well, so I'm just gonna remind everybody, yeah, use the chat box, type in your answers, type in what you think, use the comment thread if you're watching on Facebook, or on livestream.com. I'm gonna be keeping an eye on those. Rob, you let me know when you wanna see the answers. Perfect, can do it. So my, uh, as Chris had introduced me briefly, my name is Rob Main, and I am the Deputy State Risk Officer for the state of North Carolina. In that role, I have the distinct pleasure of serving the Secretary and State Chief Information Officer, along with the State Chief Risk Officer within my department, the North Carolina Department Department of Information Technology. Now, a little bit about myself, and if you can indulge me, I'm I'm a family man. I love to talk about my family. I'll do so for just a very brief moment here, so if you can indulge me. Um, First, I earned an Associate of Applied Science degree 
in computer science from the Community College of Air Force. So I'm sure there is most likely some other veterans in attendance tonight. So thank you for your service if that's the case. I've uh, finished my bachelor's degree in business administration from Troy University. Uh, and I also had the opportunity and good fortune to attend East Carolina University and complete my MBA there. I retired from the United States Air Force in 2015 after a combined eight and a half years on active duty and 16 and a half years in the North Carolina Air National Guard, having deployed twice to the Middle East between 2004 and 2006 for operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom as an air logistics officer. Prior to my current role as deputy state risk officer, I had increasing uh, levels of responsibility across many different positions that begun with, or began with applications development team lead, technical operations manager, IT director, and also chief information officer for several North Carolina agencies. I'm married to Dr. Lindsay Lewis, and together we have the very precocious 15-month-old Harper Grace. And I also have an oldest son, Travis, who is in the Marine Corps himself. He's an infantryman stationed at Camp Pendleton. I have a daughter who is, lives in Garner, North Carolina, and is raising her family. And I have a younger son who is stationed over in England as a firefighter. As you can see throughout my family, service to others comes first. So I'm going to cover several topics tonight. And um, I want to start with going over a little known but vitally important state agency, my state agency, the North Carolina Department of Information Technology. Following that brief overview of NCDIT, we'll look at some very telling cyber statistics for the state of North Carolina. Next, we'll review some of the most prevalent cyber threats to North Carolina businesses first, and then followed by the cyber threats to North Carolina citizens. Following that, we'll discuss some common preventative measures to assist with strengthening your own personal cyber hygiene. And then we'll wrap things up with some clothing, closing thoughts. Now, before we jump into the rest of my presentation, I wanna set a very transparent tone with a few admissions about North Carolina, historically known as the Old North State. Let's start with what do we do well as a state? Barbecue, hush puppies, and slaw. It's widely known how far superior vinegar-based barbecue is over whatever else is out there that tries to pass itself off as barbecue. Higher education. The University of North Carolina's system's 17 campuses extend from the mountains to the coast with over 250,000 students enrolled at the 16 universities and the North Carolina School of Science and Math, the country's first public residential high school for gifted students. Aviation, Orville Wright piloted the first powered airplane, a grand total of 20 feet above the beach at Kitty Hawk, North, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina on the 17th of December, 1903. That flight lasted 12 seconds and covered 120 feet. Ironically, Michael Jordan took flight for seemingly the same amount of time and distance in the 1988 NBA All-Star Dunk Contest. Singing competitions. Scotty McCreary, born and bred in my former hometown, Garner, North Carolina, and winner of American Idol season 10. And last but not least, college basketball. 14 NCAA men's basketball national championship trophies currently on display within 195 square miles that cover Durham to Raleigh to Chapel Hill. And it's uh, very intentional that North Carolina is at the forefront of, uh, NC State is at the forefront of the other two institutions in the triangle. Hey, Rob, can I cut in? Sure thing. Uh, launch your screen share for us. I think something happened and we're not seeing all the fabulous images of barbecue and basketball that you that you've intended for us there we go oh must... my gosh okay all right there we go so where we pick let me pick up where we left off 
Now, we talked about what North Carolina does well. Now, let's talk about what we don't do well. How many of us remember Snowmageddon 2014? Well, there were several very, very meme-worthy pictures depicting the, the challenges the drivers faced on Raleigh's Glenwood Avenue that, that evening. Just going to show you a couple of them. And my, my personal favorite is the ad app from Empire Strikes Back. So let's jump into the heart of the matter here. I just wanted to start off a little light and I hope you all uh, were entertained somewhat, but let's start talking about uh, why we're here today. First of all, the North Carolina Informa Department of Information Technology, um, that's my department and it's a very little known department in the state. The IT professionals in North Carolina's Department of Information Technology are committed to providing outstanding service to their customers and the North Carolinians they serve. Led by the state chief information officer, the department is the leading provider of IT services to state agencies, local governments, and educational institutions across North Carolina. DIT provides many different services to include hosting, networking, telecommunications, desktop computing, and unified communications, which includes email and calendaring. All are very essential to the state of North Carolina, to county governments, to school districts, to municipalities, in doing, doing their job serving North Carolinians in this digital age. We offer 24 by seven by 365 support. And in this period of COVID, we've been very successful in continuing that high level of service to our customers and to North Carolinians. In a nutshell, we provide the highly available electronic foundation from Manio to Murphy, within which our customers provide critical services to you, North Carolinians. Now, does all this mean that the state of North Carolina is immune to cyber threats? In an ideal world, the answer is yes, but in reality, no. Question for you all. How many of North Carolina's counties, now we have 100, for, uh, forgive me for being elementary, for those of you that are very familiar with North Carolina counties. But let me ask you, how many counties do you think suffered a significant cybersecurity incident since the year 2016? So, all right, folks, drop your thoughts in the comments. Okay, out of 100 counties, I'm going to take a stab at it. Out of 100, how many experienced a cybersecure incident? Since 2016. Oh, gosh. Um, my guess would be a lot of them, unfortunately. Maybe I'm being pessimistic. I hope that it's... <laughs> you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an optimist. And I'm going to say that it's uh, half. Uh, you're a I little a bit over. <laughs> you're a little bit over. So there were actually 18, 18 counties that suffered a significant cybersecurity incident across the state of North Carolina. Okay. Well, uh, I wasn't the only one. Uh, Glenn said 85 out of the 100. So... <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, you and I are both rainy days over here about this. Right. <laughs> so even if it's one, that's one too many. So I'm going to dig into a little bit of um, the effects of those cybersecurity incidents to citizens, to county governments. We'll jump into a little bit of that in just a minute. Now, question for the group again. How do cybersecurity incidents affect county or local governments, not, not, not North Carolinians, not citizens, but how do you think they affect, how do you think cybersecurity incidents affect county or local governments? And this is more rhetorical. I understand that it might take a little while to, you know, type your answer into chat, but I want you to just think about that for a second. And then I'll come back with uh, some practical examples of, of what exactly occurred. So 
in the cybersecurity incidents that uh, occurred since 2016 and those 18, it's possible. Now, unfortunately, I can't go into the specifics of each individual incident, uh, but it, it stands to reason that citizen data could potentially be exploited. What would that do? That could lead to identity theft, a reduction in confidence of state government agencies. I mean, you name it, it could happen. So ultimately, we are charged with protecting, we being cybersecurity professionals in state and local governments, we're charged with protecting your data. And when there is an incident and we have to have a whole of state approach to mobilize the appropriate resources to squash that cybersecurity incident in its tracks. Another rhetorical question, but one to think about for everybody. How do cyber incidents, cybersecurity incidents, affect North Carolinians? In one of those 18 instances since 2016, where a county suffered a significant cybersecurity incident, how are North Carolinians affected? I'll give you just a, a couple of examples. Residents in those counties that are wanting to purchase a home, home inspections would be halted. Deeds couldn't be registered. Tax offices are shut down. Some may not be as upset about tax offices not being shut down than others, but that's just a reality. Marriage licenses can't be obtained. Any service that a county provides within which that county relies upon its digital infrastructure is impacted by a significant cybersecurity incident. So as you can see, as, we, as I've shared with you, there are many different gotchas when it comes to, or many different effects of cybersecurity incidents on everyday North Carolinians. That's why it makes my job, the state chief risk officer's job, and all of the other cybersecurity professionals in the public and private sector, that's why it makes our job so important to allow us to continue to exist in the digital age free from threats, free from identity theft. I want to go over some cybercrime statistics. Now, since 2013, now I'm, I'm broadening out that spectrum a little bit more uh, beyond the 2016 marker that I put down the table in our, in our last slide. But since 2016, 170 counties, cities, and state government systems were attacked across the U.S. since 2013. That is astounding. And I guess this just underscores, highlights, and bolds the fact that no matter what's going on in our nation and in our, in our world, malicious actors, cyber threat actors never take a break. The moment you let your guard down as a home consumer of internet services or as a business professional in the cyber, cyber world, the moment we let our guard down is when we suffer the ramifications of not having strong cyber hygiene and not keeping our guard up. In North Carolina, as I said previously on the previous slide, we've had 18 significant cybersecurity incidents since 2016. We've had 10 ransomware incidents alone in 2019. That's a lot. And let me, let me paint a picture for all of the attendees to this discussion today, tonight. When a county has a, a cybersecurity incident, it mobilizes every arm of our cyber defense structure in the state. That includes state agency involvement our federal partners at the FBI and Homeland Security, our vendor partners to include uh, some of our bigger players. The, you, you may recognize some of their names without me even saying it, but they're a major operating system producer that dominates the world market. We get a lot of folks involved. It's a full mobilization and it's a full court press because we realize how interconnected each individual county is with each other and how counties are interconnected with state government. 
drawing back, it's also very easily recognizable that the home consumer, you, the citizen, interact with state agencies. Maybe you're applying for a permit online. Maybe you're trying to renew your driver's license online. So therein lies a connection between you and a state government agency. So what I'm trying to present to you is an awareness of the impact of cyber threats to state government, but also in a, in a future slide, you'll see what you can do as a citizen to protect yourself and also protect your relationships with other private sector businesses or government agencies. Now in 2019, North Carolina made a top 20 list that isn't necessarily uh, worth cheering about. We were top 20 in the nation in terms of the total number of victims of cyber crime. There were 8,223 victims altogether with a $48.4 million total loss across all the victims of cyber threats, cyber theft. That is astounding. I want to point out the graphic on the slide on the bottom right hand corner. This comes right from the FBI and the Internet Crime Report for last year. I want to point out the most vulnerable population in terms of cybercrime and total loss, and that's our over 60 population. Of the over 60, the total loss is 800 and $35 million plus. That is quite astounding. I'm going to go into ways that we can help both as family members of folks that are 60 and older or as cyber professionals, how we can help those, that vulnerable population. So let's talk about cyber threats to North Carolina businesses. So the FBI has identified five main scenarios by which business email compromise, business email compromises occur. Now, first of all, let's start off by defining what a business email compromise is. That is, it's a sophisticated scam targeting businesses, basically attempting to solicit the transfer of funds or the transfer of data that might do harm to the business. I give you uh, one, one of the five scenarios that the FBI identified. Business happens to be working with a foreign supplier. The scam takes advantage of a long-standing wire transfer relationship with a supplier, but asks for the funds to be sent to an alternative fraudulent account. This happens every day in North Carolina, multiple times a day. That's just one of the five different scenarios that the FBI commonly encounters, but it is the most prevalent. Another threat to North Carolina, ransomware attacks. So a ransomware attack is basically a type of malicious software designed to do a number of different things. Mostly it's to block a computer system or to encrypt the data on a computer system, whether it be your home computer or you're a, a computer at work whenever we do go back into the office to work. Uh, but basically a ransomware attack is exactly as it sounds. The malicious person has inserted a program that encrypts your data on your computer and holds it for ransom and it leaves a ransom note. This is real. It's happening every day, many times a day to private and public sector businesses, as well as personal, uh, personal internet users. Let me ask you a question. This is for the attendees. How do you think of business email compromise impacting a state agency, state government agency would affect you as a North Carolinian? And again, Chris, this may be more rhetorical, but let's say with the impact that COVID has had on you know, the fiscal position of North Carolina. Every, every single budget dollar is gonna to have to be maximized to its greatest effectiveness 
if a state agency or a county government falls subject to a business email compromise and funds are lost, that just makes the position of that agency, that county, much more dire, especially during this period of COVID. A third threat to cyber uh, to North Carolina businesses is fishing, fishing, smishing, and farming. That's a that's a mouthful, but basically, fishing is uh, exactly as it sounds. You're going fishing for information. Somebody is attempting to solicit personal information from the recipient of the email, in in an effort to perhaps steal an identity or to commit fraud on that individual. Vishing is actually the same thing as phishing, but done over a phone call. How many of us have received spam calls or vishing calls asking you to extend your car's warranty? That seems to be a very popular vishing scenario nowadays. Chris, you're nodding your head. I, I assume you've gotten one yourself. Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to actually uh, purchase a new vehicle uh, some months back and oh my gosh the number of phone calls and the number of little pamphlets in the mail with uh you know act now and urgent uh, it's weekly i get probably at least two to three a day and i have not bought a new car in three years so <laughs> I don't want to extend a car a car warranty on a used vehicle. It's not it's not important to me right now. So, vishing again. They the attempt there is to solicit the the target to provide information about themselves. Hey, it's a great opportunity to extend your car's warranty. All we need is your credit card number, its expiration, and the three digit code on the back. Typical vishing scenario. Smishing is actually the sim similar to vishing and phishing, but smishing occurs via text or uh, via text messaging. Uh, similar scenario. It's it's another attempt to get your personal information by which they can be used against you to steal your identity or steal some of your funds, steal some credit card uh, information. And lastly, farming. Farming is actually fishing without a lure. Basically, it's an attempt to redirect you through, um, redirect you to another website uh, through a DNS exploitation. And I'm going to go into what DNS is for a second. It's um, little known to the consumer, to the average consumer of internet services at home. But basically, it's a it's a redirect. It's like a three car money. You're trying to figure out which website is the right website that you're trying to get to. If you know that your bank is abcbank.com, that that's the address for your personal financial institution. Through a farming attempt, that farmer, the farmer, the fraudulent actor, may attempt to steer you to abcc.com. It looks almost exactly like what you're used to with your bank, your bank's website address. And if you're not careful, you can be directed there. And next thing you know, your bank account is drained because you've provided your login credentials to that financial institution that's uh, being masked. So I, I've presented a lot of information. Let's all take a breath for a second. Uh, Chris, do we have a comfort level of uh, people's cybersecurity level? We do. We do. So I've got, there's a three, uh, around a four, a three, a two. Uh, let's see. This user, LoneWolf1330, says they're a one, unfortunately. And then uh, let me check over here on Facebook real quick where folks are watching too. Okay, Sean is a one. Charles is a two, and uh, I'm not really sure. You know, nobody's a five, and nobody's a zero. That's good. So, so I think that's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> we're, we're all in the bell curve. 
There we go. <laughs> I'm no statistician, but I'm I'm pretty sure we have a good good distribution there. <laughs> so um, I ask what your comfort level is because I wanted to just you know set a tone um, in terms of where you're at now and where you can be. The first thing that I would recommend for those that were on the lower end of that scale is to, and I hate to say this because I'm a generally a positive person, but always be wary, be skeptical of, you know, emails that you receive, of random phone calls that you receive. Um, threat actors, the people that are wishing to steal your identity, to commit cyber fraud against you, they are very sophisticated and they're only getting more sophisticated over time. Their tools are increasingly more difficult to block. And the key, frankly, it all comes down to education, equipping yourself with the knowledge of how to recognize what a fraud attempt is, how to recognize when you get a call from an unknown individual that they may be, they may be expressing a sense of urgency over a particular scenario. And I'm going to go into that in our next slide with the elder fraud example. But always be skeptical of any, anything that sounds either too good or too urgent. I'm going to go into a few examples here in just a little bit. Now, for the folks that are at the, at the higher end of the scale, congratulations. That's um, to be comfortable in this electronic age that we're living in. Uh, it's, it's a good thing. It makes you it gives you a better sense of security, personal security. Uh, but I do caution you to not rest on your laurels either, to you know, have a health, healthy level of skepticism when you're dealing with um, any particular agency or business electronically. Always look to make sure that when you're doing business online, that you are doing business online in a secure and encrypted manner. Now, a question for the group, do you all know how to recognize if you are browsing the internet, whether or not you are looking at an encrypt or you are looking at data through an encryption, an encrypted tunnel? So I, hmm. That's a, I, it's a I'm used question. to seeing, you know, like some different icons like on my browser, mm -hmm. but is that the same thing as like a, a secure connection or an encrypted connection? So, yes, it is. Um, a common way to identify that you're using a secure communication channel to visit your bank or to buy something off of Amazon is at the front of the address, you'll see HTTPS as the first five letters. And if that's not present, your browser should display a padlock icon that looks to be locked. If it is a padlock that is not locked, then under no circumstance should you enter your login credentials for the resource or provide any personally identifiable information or credit card information. The key is to look for that padlock in the address bar of your browser. I'm not gonna specify which browser because they all behave similarly. So uh, let's see here. Allie and Susan got it right. They they uh, with question marks. They they guessed that it was the lock icon near the URL uh, on a browser. Although Allie threw out an interesting thing, or a VPN. Or VPN, correct. Now VPN, what that provides to you. Now this is we're right now we're in the 100 level freshman course. VPN will take it to the graduate level, but let's let's touch on that for a second. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And uh, basically what that provides is a level of security between your computer, wherever you may be, and the VPN server, wherever it's hosted. And I'll give you an example. I, I currently live in Wendell, North Carolina. I have access to a VPN server at the Department of Information Technology. Most of my resources that I access 
are within either the North Carolina Department of Information Technology Data Center or they're cloud-based. Now, what a VPN does between my computer and my home, because I've been working from home for 7,397 days, um, a VPN provides basically a wrapper around my electronic pathway between my computer and the VPN server at the Department of Information Technology. And that wrapper is an encrypted tunnel that keeps you from being subject to man in the middle attacks, uh, from hot session hijacking. And again, this is, this is more of a graduate level discussion, but uh, kudos to, was Ali that brought that up, Chris? Kudos yep. to you, Ali. Good awareness and uh, great information on your part. Thank you for providing that. Now let's talk about uh, cyber threats to North Carolina residents. And I briefly touched on our most vulnerable, vulnerable population in terms of total loss in the 60 and older age group, according to the FBI. Uh, there've been a number of things that um, have been attempted to be, uh, have been enacted in an attempt to protect our um, older population. First and foremost, the Elder Abuse Prevention and Prosecution Act, uh, having been signed into law in 2017, uh, that really strengthens the um, prosecution of those who commit crimes against uh, those who commit fraud against our elderly, elderly population. Uh, its intent was to prevent the exploitation and also improve the prosecution of those who commit these crimes. Now, I, I want to take some time here to go over some uh, of the most common elder fraud schemes. And as I go through these, please drop in the chat window if you have any personal experience, whether it be yourself or a family member with any of these uh, particular schemes. So first of all, uh, Medicare and health insurance scams. So let, me, let me take a step back for a second. Scams generally have um, a repeatable pattern. They attempt to exploit either natural disasters or pandemics. Who would have thought we would have had a pandemic in our lifetime? Uh, Medicare enrollment, which is very regular through the year. So keep that in mind as I go through these top 10 schemes of elder fraud. Uh, the top scheme is Medicare, health and Medicare and health insurance scams. Uh, as we all know, everyone 65 and older qualifies for Medicare in the United States. So within that vein, fraudsters would attempt to take advantage of the elderly, elderly population, the 60 plus population by attempting to steer that population to uh, maybe a firm that can help you navigate, uh, allegedly help you navigate the waters of Medicare enrollment. Very common scheme. Please ensure that your family members are aware that there's uh, many resources that the elder population can visit or talk to on the phone. Uh, there's no sense of urgency in the enrollment uh, in the in the months leading up to the enrollment, talk to the resources such as the Department of Insurance in the state of North Carolina. Uh, is uh, they have a very popular service that adv that advises seniors on Medicare enrollment, and that's the North Carolina Department of Insurance. Second most common fraud scheme is uh, counterfeit prescription drugs. Everybody can make uh, every froster purports that they can provide a prescription drug at one one thousandth of the cost of what you're paying for it. All you have to do is send them uh, a couple of hundred bucks. They'll get you registered in their system and they'll start that prescription drug that you need flowing to you at that discounted price. Very common fraud. I'm just going to roll through the remainder of these here. Uh, three through ten. Funeral and cemetery scams, fraudulent anti-aging products. Ponce de Leon may have found the fountain of youth, but it does not exist today. 
telemarketing and phone scams. As a group, the P, as a group of um, or as a segment of the population, people in the 60 plus age group make twice as many purchases over the phone. So phone fraud is very prevalent in the 60 plus age group. Internet fraud, investment schemes, reverse mortgages, sweepstakes and lottery scams, and the grandparent scam. And I'm gonna get personal here for a second on this one. So my father, who was born in 1946, 74 years old, um, very sharp, he was my role model growing up. He's a wealth of knowledge and I learned more from him uh, than I can ever begin to impart upon my own children, although I try. He fell victim to this particular scam. He gets a phone call on a random weekday and the caller said, grandfather, I've been arrested. I need you to send $300 down to the insert city name police department to bail me out. Is there anybody on this call who is aware of a, a similar circumstance in your circle of friends or family? Do we see any in chat, Chris? I'm gonna, I'll finish the story up here in a second. Uh, I, th I think we're all locked intently on, on these schemes and on these stories. Gotcha. So, in Paul, in the in trying to channel Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. First of all, my father called me frantically. Uh, he was frantic and he said, Oh my gosh, your son, your oldest son is in jail. I don't know what he did wrong. And I, I said, Hey, dad, let's take a step back for a second. What exactly did the person say who called you on the phone? And he said, Grandfather, I'm in jail. Well, that right there should have tipped my dad off. My kids have always called him granddad. Never once have they called him grandfather. So it's not uncommon for these fraudsters to try to gain knowledge of where the 60 plus um, folks live in the communities. And they try to prey on um, grandfatherly or grandmotherly instincts, protect your grandkids, love them. Oh my gosh, there's no chance that my grandchild can be in jail. I need to bail him or her out. So this is a very uh, personal fraud scheme that impacted a member of my family. And I hope that by sharing this scenario with you all, that you all can share it with your circle of influence to make sure that the people that are near and dear to you do not fall prey to this as well. Long story short, money did leave my father's bank account. I was able to get it back for him. And unfortunately, there was never a prosecution because, you know, as quickly as the person came into, the fraudster came into my father's life, they, they left as quick. So there's very, it's very difficult to trace down these malicious actors in cyberspace. We do a pretty decent job, but it's, it can be challenging. Any input and in chat on any of the schemes that I mentioned, or does anybody need elaboration? Well, uh, Susan mentioned that they'd never heard of the grandparent uh, scheme and says, that's awful. And I agree with you, Susan. That's a terrible thing. Uh, Glenn also left a, a cool comment here. He says, you need to check the URL, particularly the host name. Host names are registered, but they can change a letter and it won't be the same, but look very similar. So I think you alluded to a, a little bit earlier uh, in the talk too, but like you want to go to naturalsciences.org, not nnaturalsciences. Exactly. Dot .org. Because we're so conditioned. Uh, we actually, and I am no um, expert when it comes to learning theory by any means, but my eyes skip over and will have a tendency to overlook that misplaced character or that additional character. So I have to be on my own person. I have my guard has to be up and super high if I'm doing business online to look out for that slight variation in the name where 
the, the website may look exactly the same as the one you expect, but as soon as you enter your credentials or your account information or your credit card information, I can guarantee you it's on the dark web and it's being sold to the highest bidder. So be very wary. Thank you for that input in chat. Be very wary of the way that you, the common websites that you access are spelled. And if you, there's ever any doubt, you can always call that institution and have them verify the name of their website, their address specifically. Moving on, how can you, or what steps can you take? What preventive measures can you take to secure yourself at your home? First of all, strong cyber hygiene is critically important. You should always keep your firewall turned on. Now I can't go into exactly how you do that for your particular situation, but you can always contact the manufacturer of your computer, the manufacturer of your mobile device and ask them how to do so, but keep your firewall turned on. Implement DNS security. And we're going to actually talk about DNS security in the next slide in more depth. Install or update antivirus software. Get some anti-spyware technology and make sure that it's up to date and installed on your computer or your mobile device. Keep your operating system up to date. Make sure that Windows, if you're a Windows user or the Mac OS or the Linux distribution that you're using, always make sure that you apply patches swiftly as soon as they're released. Use strong passwords. I'm just going to throw this out here rhetorically. How many of you think that password one, two, three, four is a good password? I say that tongue in cheek that uh, I don't want to take anything for granted though, because I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page here. The National Standards Institute um, has some very tell or has some very clear password recommendations for the home consumer. Minimum of eight characters and a maximum of 64 characters. Now, when I say characters, that could be alpha and that could be numeric. And it can also be any special character. But it can, uh, the recommendation is to allow or to use those special characters to the greatest extent you can. You want to avoid sequential characters in a password. ABC123, not so good. You also want to avoid using context specific passwords, like for your home Wi Fi. If you have a home Wi Fi network, the worst thing you could do is make your street address your Wi Fi password. It's very common. You see it all the time. I reckon, recommend strongly against doing that. You also want to uh, minimize your use of commonly used passwords and dictionary words. Multi-factor authentication, I throw this out there for chat. Who knows what multi-factor authentication is? I'm gonna jump forward and I'll wait for Chris to see if there's any response. Turn off location sharing. As interesting as it may be to share with your social media audience where you've eaten or where you've worked out, not a good idea to have your location turned on or give indications to the general public or those who may be consuming your social media site where you're at and when you're there. Disable the Wi-Fi auto join feature of mobile devices. Let me give you an example of um, how this can cause you trouble. I drink at Starbucks. I love coffee. Starbucks is convenient. If I were to connect to a Starbucks Wi-Fi while I'm waiting for my latte of the day, it typically would be named something similar to Starbucks, the network name. If my mobile device is configured to auto join that network, then any time that I encounter a Starbucks network, whether it be at a legitimate Starbucks in the future, 
or by somebody who's fraudulently broadcasting a network name of Starbucks. If your machine, if your device is set to auto join, you've just joined their network and now you're, you're their prey. They have the ability to connect to your device and to potentially steal your data. So disable the Wi-Fi auto join feature on mobile devices. And very basically, if you're not using the device, turn it off. And I know that's easier said than done. We're so digitally connected nowadays. Do we have any response to uh, my question, Chris? Oh yeah, we've got some some really smart people <laughs> watching the program. So uh, Ali, Lone Wolf, and Glenn on watching on YouTube all got it right in one way or another. You have to put in your password and confirm the login on another device, app, or email, or you get an email or a text, or uh, you know, I'm not uh, or using a password and then having to key a, a PIN number in later. Perfect. That that hit the nail right on the head. Without going into the scientific details, uh, multi-factor authentication, you guys nailed it. If I had a piece of candy and we were in a classroom, I would throw a piece of candy to your desk. So uh, I mentioned in the previous slide DNS security. I'm not going to go into this in depth because we get, we have um, we're about eight minutes to the top of the hour. Chris, how are we looking on time? Uh, Let's, uh, there's some questions here that I definitely want to get to. Okay. Okay. I'll go through the rest of this uh, rather briskly, and then we'll get to the questions. So without going into details, DNS security, uh, I recommend you Googling DNS security. Uh, DNS stands for domain name service. And very, very basically, DNS provides you the ability to translate npr.org or any other website address into an IP address. If you look on the slide, the first bullet, the 216.35.221.76, who wants to remember that when they're just trying to get to npr.org? Alternatively, the IP version 6 address, who would want to remember that hexadecimal address instead of npr.org? DNS provides that translation between human readable format and the IP addressing scheme that the internet uses. And it also is subject to many different types of threats. I wanna leave you with um, Quad9. It's a free service that you can implement on your home network. That's QAD, the number nine. Uh, please do some research after this session. Um, it's a freely available DNS security tool and I'll just leave that at that. Uh, some behaviors that you can engage. Very simply, keep your personal information personal. Be wary of how much you're sharing on social media. Please avoid answering quizzes online. And let me go into that just very briefly. Uh, a trend nowadays is for you to tell people how many states you lived in on Facebook or uh, what concerts you've been to. All of these little quizzes that you may see on social media, they may seem innocuous on the surface, but when combined as an aggregate, they can be used as a method by which somebody can steal your personal information. Those of you on the, uh, on the session tonight, I'm sure you're familiar with challenge answers or challenge questions and answers when it comes to account maintenance, like your bank account maintenance. Who was your first grade teacher? What was your wife's or husband's maid? Uh, what was your wife's maiden name? Or where did you meet your husband? They may seem innocuous to answer those quizzes on social media, but trust me, it's not worth providing an answer. Just let that little quiz pass by. Your life will be better for not having participated in it. And again, turn your location off and educate yourself on cyber threats. So, as a few closing thoughts, cyber threats will only increase. The bad guys and girls are persistent. Knowledge is power. And don't be a cyber hygiene paperclip because the, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Covered a lot of ground. Um, went over some of the threats that face North Carolina governments, that face North Carolina citizens went over some 
uh, common traps, common schemes, and also provide you some do's and don'ts with regard to behavior that you can engage in and protect your uh, cyber identity. I want to turn it back over to Chris. That concludes my presentation, but I'll be here for questions. All right. Thank you very much, Rob. There's a, there's a lot in there for folks to think about uh, and process. So we'll take a, few, a minute, let everybody gather your thoughts, your questions, and then, yeah, pop them into the chat box over there and into the comments, and uh, we'll be checking those and posing the rub. So let me go ahead and throw a couple that came in during the presentation towards you. Uh, I like this one. Can't criminals create a padlock icon in a browser to fool a user? Like, you know, if I'm just browsing the web, how do I know that I'm not being tricked by something? That's a great question. And whoever provided that, thank you for doing so. Um, I like the way you're thinking. The skepticism has to be there in order to, you know, always be on guard. Um, now, getting back to some other information that I've shared. In order to avoid a circumstance or a situation like that, you should always keep your operating system up to date. And that could be Windows, Mac OS, um, Linux, any Linux distribution that you may use. But doing so will, uh, will help prevent such, of a, uh, such a scheme from occurring, from somebody hijacking your browser on your computer and making it look like you are actually operating in an encrypted and secure way. So thank you for that question. The key is actually keeping your software, keeping your operating systems up to date and your software up to date by performing regular updates and regular uh, software or regular updates. I'll just leave it at that. Excellent stuff. Uh, Charles watching on Facebook had this question. It's a good one too. What should I do if I receive a fraudulent email or phone call? If this is happening to you, what do you do about it? So we have a mechanism in the in North Carolina's Department of Information Technology to uh, a reporting mechanism. Um, people can send the offending messages to a common mailbox and we will take care of uh, that particular sender. We would blacklist them so that particular sending address can no longer send those types of messages. But what do you do as a, as a citizen in, at home? Delete the message mark it as spam, move it to your spam folder. So your email client starts to learn your habits. It knows that you're going to move anything that arrives from fraudster at fraud today.com. And anytime you move that to spam, it's going to move all those future messages from that same address to spam. So you can either delete it. If it looks legitimate, you can, reach out to the person through other means that you think sent the message to say, Hey, can you verify the legitimacy of this email? It says it came from you and verify it through other means. Don't reply to the message itself. Uh, but always be skeptical. Worst case scenario, delete the message. Charles also posted an interesting comment um, about the, the complexity of dealing with this problem globally. Uh, I mean, his comment was we need a worldwide internet police force uh, or, and why there's not some global organization that tracks all of this down. But I mean, the way that you described it, even towards the beginning, it's so incredibly complex and the, the, the bad actors, the fraudsters can be individuals anywhere in the world with right. an internet connection doing this sort of thing. So in my personal family circle, I can't get two family members to agree on what time it is. So <laughs> expanding that out to a global audience while, you know, it's a good fight to join in and to team up with other States, other nations. Um, it is an extremely complex issue. There's, um, international laws that come into play, federal laws. But what we do uh, as a state is that when we identify a threat that's affecting North Carolinians, we roll that up to the, the multi-state information sharing and analysis center. 
so that our peer states will have an awareness of that same threat so they wouldn't fall subject to it as well. Like a, a new ransomware variant that's making its rounds. If we identify it and trap it, we're going to take that variant, send it to that multi-state body, and they're going to share it with uh, the 49 other states and territories. So thank you for that question. Go on. All right. Now, I don't, th this is another good question because it's something that I'm not sure about either. And it could be a myth, but, but I'm not really sure. And sitting here working off of an Apple MacBook, I'm, I would be concerned about it. Two people have wanted to know, uh, can, what can Mac users do to protect themselves? Virus software all seems to be for Windows. And yeah, you know, I want to say that I always heard that uh, an Apple computer can't get a virus, but it's still a computer on the internet. So uh, let me dispel that myth. Apple's, uh, I am um, I am uh, operating system agnostic. I have to use them all. I have no preference. So let me start by saying that. Uh, Macs do get viruses. Macs do have software vulnerabilities that can be exploited by uh, attacks or exploitations. So uh, unfortunately, it's a reality. Uh, the best thing you can do, again, getting back to keeping your operating system up to date, you know, when Mac releases its latest operating system update, apply it as soon as you can. And when they release an update for the iOS, apply it on your mobile device. When when um, the Android OS gets updated, as soon as you can, apply it. And that holds true for your applications that are installed on the Mac OS as well or on the on your Windows PC. Make sure that if that, if that particular vendor, the maker of that application provides an update, that you apply it as soon as possible. There's a reason why updates are sent out. And that's to typically address bugs that may lead to exploitation of your computer or your personally identifiable information. So great question about Macs. I've heard that said oftentimes myself, real world Macs do get viruses and your best defense is antivirus software and keeping your operating system up to date. So there are products out there that folks can get for, for an Apple device or an Apple computer that works the same as the products that we all know of about for PCs. Absolutely. Okay. Antivirus software, anti-spyware software. Getting back to an earlier slide, keep your firewall turned on. Again, consult your the manufacturer of your device for steps on how to do that. I can't go into that right now. But. Sure thing. And what about uh, telling apart, let's say, you know, a good anti-spyware or antivirus program from one that could be fraudulent or just isn't great or isn't going to work so well. Because, right, I could hit an internet search engine and s type in anti-spyware and then look at the front page of Google to see what links I should click on. But does does Google know to give me the best <laughs> results? Right. How, how do I know that, you know, what an internet search engine is showing me is going to so be the right one. Wow. We would need probably three days to talk about that topic, about how to promote, <laughs> promote your tools on a search result. Um, so the, really the only recommendation I can make is make sure that you, the, the source that is providing you the information is trusted. Uh, if there's certain antivirus packages that actually embed themselves within your browser to, pro to provide you a heads up in your Google search result as to whether or not the site is valid or if it's known to be fraudulent. So use antivirus software, embed it within your browser, make sure that the browser plugin is also installed for Chrome, for Firefox, for Safari. And as you search, look for the visual cues on whether or not the link that you're about to click on is safe. Can't recommend one site over another. Uh, a, a generally, a reputable uh, resource would be Consumer Reports, PC Mag, but um, those are more consumer-based and not not as technical. So, based on the the comfort level in our audience, they may prefer another resource. So, um, use that browser plugin for your antivirus software. 
rely, uh, don't fully rely upon it, but use it as a cue as to whether or not the site that you're about to click on is safe. Last question. This one's from me. How does being a risk officer, somebody, right, you're 40 or more hours a week, you're dealing with attacks coming from the web and statewide too. So every state employee's computer it is a an entry point for somebody to try to take advantage of North Carolinians. But okay, here's the question. Being a risk officer, seeing the risk come through every single day, how does that change how you live your life? Like once you go home and you're, you know, just scrolling your own social media feeds, if you're on social media. Sure. Are you on social media? Did you delete them all? You said, no, I can't. It's too risky. I do not use TikTok. I can tell you that. <laughs> but I, I do consume social media. It's because uh, I was doing it to monitor my uh, now adult children. Uh, <laughs> so that being that being what it is. Um, so it it gets back to being skeptical. And I hate to, uh, I'm a generally a positive person. I like to look on the bright side of things. Uh, for instance, under COVID and the telework model that we have, it's allowed me to spend more time with my 15 month old daughter at home. Um, but unfortunately, the, the threats that I've seen, the actual tangible results of ransomware incidents of identity theft causes me to over communicate with anybody that will listen. Hey, do you, have you changed your password? Do you maintain strong cyber hygiene? And that includes friends and family, anybody that will listen. Um, Cybersecurity can be somewhat daunting for, um, for some, but um, what I enjoy about this job is that I get to make it approachable. I get to make it um, easier to understand and to uh, really wrap your arms around. But, you know, I, we, cyber actors never sleep and it seemingly never do we. That's as good a place as any to wrap it up, I think. Rob, thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us at the Science Cafe. Hey, I really appreciate you having me, Chris. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Uh, as soon as you log off of this program, go change your password because <laughs> you're probably overdue for it. And uh, hey, after you do that, you can check out naturalsciences.org, perfectly safe website. Why? Because it's helped maintained by people like Rob with the state of North Carolina, right? So naturalsciences.org, that's where you can get information about more live programs that are coming up in the future, as well as a lot more cool science at home, do-it-yourself experiments, programs, videos, activities. It's a great resource for you, anything to meet your science needs right now. Follow the museum. We're on social media, at Natural Sciences, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And... Uh, you know what? We'll be back here next Thursday night, seven o'clock. Uh, next week, we'll be hearing from the museum's research curator of paleontology. We'll be talking about the dawn of the dinosaurs. That's next Thursday, seven o'clock, right here on the museum's uh, YouTube and Facebook pages. So mark your calendars, click the bell, subscribe down there into the channel. That way you'll get a notification when we're live with the next program. And hope we'll see you again real soon. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Bye.